Thank you. Um, as readers, we see the end product. It's almost as if we are noticing an iceberg. And uh, the book is the visible part of the iceberg. But we really don't get any uh, real understanding or glimpses into the process of the writing and the process of the research. Um, this will give you a little bit of, a, of an insight. Um, people always ask me, well, how did you find out about this story? Um, no one knew about it. How did you find out about it? Well, it went like this. Pop, pop, I got to tell you something. And my daughter-in-law pulled me by the, the elbow and she said, I got to tell you something. A friend of mine told me that he went to a graduation at Hampton Sydney College several, quite a few years ago, and he stayed at a B&B &B in Burkeville. The name of the B&B &B was Hyde Park Farm. And when he went uh, to the uh, breakfast uh, after he slept overnight there, he looked out in the back and he saw these through the, a very large picture window, he saw 10 very substantial log buildings. And he asked the waitress, what are those buildings back there? And she said, those are the Jew huts. There were these people called Jews who lived here. Well, that was sort of strange, Jew huts. People called Jews, almost as if it, looking back into a non-existent civilization that had vanished somehow. She told me that, and five years later, after a tremendous amount of research up and down the coast, and speaking with people in Australia, in Europe, Israel, I now understand what that waitress meant, Jew huts those people called Jews. Two and a half years I was at the National Archives searching for records, dragging my wife Marsha along with me the whole way. The very last day that we were going to look for one particular insight that I needed, the State Department records on immigrants coming to the United States, going to a farm, on Burkeville, in Burkeville, Virginia. I was ready to give up. And I sat one of the archivists down and I said, please, please, let me tell you the story. I'm looking for records, State Department records of immigrants, so forth and so forth. And he shook his head. I said, every time I would get in the records, there would be an orange piece of paper and there would be a name that I wanted to do research on. And that name, that piece of paper said, Ernst Kramer, for an example, killed Hyde Farmlands. Killed? Did that mean purged? Did it mean transferred? No one knew. The archivist didn't know. And he said, finally, I don't know what that means. He said, come with me. And so he took me into the archives. Now, if you're not an archivist, this is like going to Mecca. This is like going to the penetralium, indeed, of, of, of the world's records. And we went into one door and opened up with a, with a plastic card and then went into another door with a plastic card, another door with a plastic card. And I thought, and especially some of you here will remember, I felt like I was going into Jack Benny's vault. <laughs> Finally, we get into the room and there's a huge room about, oh, I would say a city block long. Shelf after shelf of metal shelf, box after box, sort of dark in there. We went to one end of the room and he said, well, look here, and I'll look there. No, no. And all of a sudden, he said, mm, let's try something. He walked clear across this huge room. And he got on all fours, and he pulled out a box. And he says, I don't know, but. And he gave me the box. I pulled out the shelf, and I look in the box, and, and I'm pushing. I'm looking and looking and looking. And at the very end of the box are 210 pages of all the State Department records dealing with immigrants these people I was interested in coming to the United States, hide farmlands. I turned to him and I hugged him. He was a very shy guy. And he looked at me, I could, I could, and it was dark. And I said, I said, you did it, you did it, after two and a half years. And then he did something that I will never forget for the rest of my life. He pointed to 
a shelf filled with boxes. And he said, you were the first person in over 70 years ever to open that box. He said, you will now know more than anyone else in the world. And I thought to myself, what a responsibility. And he, and, he, and he pointed to the other boxes and he said, every single one of these boxes has a story to, to tell. It's screaming to be told and no one comes down here. Let's tell the story. This is Werner Angris, about 16 years old. Look how menacing he is. He is the enemy of the Nazi regime. He is dangerous. Watch out for him. He represents what was going on in Germany in the 1930s. The Jewish community, of course, was being strangled, strangled by the Nazi edicts, by Nuremberg laws. Citizenship was, was, was stripped away from Jews who thought they were Germans, and all of a sudden they realized according to edict, they were no longer German citizens. Teenagers had an extraordinarily difficult time. Teenagers always have problems. They're problems of identity. Who am I? And all of a sudden now, not only who am I as a human being, but who am I as a German, as a Jew? They were kicked out of their schools. They were depressed. They were scared. They lived in what I call the land of whispers. Parents whispering to each other, what are we going to do? We don't have an income. How can we leave Germany? We don't have money. Should we send somehow grandparents away? How can they possibly make a change in their lives at their stage of the game? Whispers. And the last whisper, should we send our kids away? Parents thinking they would separate and send their kids away. In 1933, Leo Beck, a leader in the Berlin community, in the German community, said, 1933, the end of German Judaism has arrived. And an American Jewish Committee bulletin said, if the future of adult Jews in Germany is hopeless, what can we say about the future of Jewish children? To give you an example, this is Eva's passport. You'll meet Eva a little bit later on. Eva went to England in 1935. She went to England in 1935 to go to a, uh, a boarding school to study English. The same passport she used in 1939. And look what's happened between 35 and 39. 39 all of a sudden has a J for Juden for Jew. And if you miss that, bureaucrats, we are underlining the name in red. And not only that, her name now is Sarah. For all the Jewish girls and all the Jewish women now took on the name of Sarah and all the men took on the name of Israel. What was the Jewish community in Germany going to do? They decided that in order to get the kids out of Germany, they had to develop agricultural training institutes. And the reasoning behind this was that if they could train youngsters to become agriculturalists, farmers, technicians, other countries would want them because they thought farmers were always in demand. And they bought, or rather leased for nothing, Grossbrasen, which was a training institute in Germany. The person who became the head of this Grossbrasen Institute to train these people was a social psychologist, Kurt Bondi, an amazing man, way ahead of his time. His specialty was how do you treat juvenile delinquents and turn their lives around. His professorships, of course, were stripped through the Nuremberg Laws. They settled on Grossbrasen, and Grossbrasen became a, an island of safety for these kids because they were insulated, if you will, from the, 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 the maniacal prejudice and discrimination and assault on the Jewish people. 
they made great friends. There were about 100 of them in their first class that went from 1936 to 1938. That's what was happening.